Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My guest today is David Goodman. David, how are you? I am great, Melinda. Great to see you. I am so glad that you're going that you're on my TV show today. Uh, I want to tell my viewers a little bit about you. David Goodman is the New York Times best-selling author of a dozen books, host of the public affairs radio show and podcast, The Vermont Conversation, and a journalist for national publications. David's award-winning reporting ranges from covering world and national politics to the threat of climate change in Alaska and Africa, the outdoors, adventure travel, and the impact of a natural disaster on his hometown in Vermont. As a longtime contributing writer for Mother Jones, his articles were part of a package that won the prestigious National Magazine Award for General Excellence. His writing has also appeared in the New York Times, Outside, Boston Globe, Travel and Leisure, Ski, the Los Angeles Times, and other publications. You are a marvel. <laughs> well, a thank marvel. you. A marvel. And I am so excited to have you on my show and learn, and learn more about you. So, David, let's start right up. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and who had the greatest influence on you. Well, I think my parents had the greatest influence on me. I think, um, you know, they were both very involved in the community. My father was a local ophthalmologist where I grew up in Bayshore, Long Island, but he was very engaged in the community. He headed a task force to integrate the um, five elementary schools in my community, which was some of my earliest memories were of these raucous, huge community meetings. And he was the mild manager doctor at the head of the high school auditorium trying to reassure people that everything was going to be okay, that but people needed a level playing field in education. So, and my mom was a social worker and together they were very involved in the peace movement. Um, so those would be some of my biggest um, influences. Then I would say my clarinet teacher was a big influence on me. I was I was going to be a professional musician. I'm supposed to be sitting in some big orchestra somewhere playing clarinet. That's what I thought I was going to do at age 18. And I was deciding between going to conservatory and going to college. I chose college. And well, there's a few other things besides music going on when you go to college. And I got interested in all these other things. But I still play clarinet in local amateur orchestras around Burlington which is um, something I love to do and keeps me sane. But I think from my clarinet teacher, I learned how to be self-critical and how to constantly push myself to be better and try and raise the bar and raise the bar, listen to myself. And um, I've always thought that was one of the great gifts that uh, he gave me um, when I studied with him. So there you go. There's is he, is he still people. alive and has he followed your career? Um, he uh, passed away about 10, 12 years ago. I resumed studying with him when he was 89. Um, you know, it was a dozen years ago when I found out he was still alive. Because, I, you know, I took um, about 40 years off between lessons, 30 years off. And so um, it was really a wonderful few years going back to him. Uh, this big figure in my life and taking music lessons again. That must have been such a thrill for him. Uh, it, it was a thrill for both of us. For both of you, but especially for him to have his old his, his young student come back as an older man and want to study under him. Um, I've never heard you play your clarinet, so I want you to make sure that you let all of us know when you're playing, because I would love to come and hear you play, David. Um, so I want to ask you, what brought you to Vermont? And tell us how you met Sue, your fabulous wife, Sue, who you've been married to for 31 years. And congratulations on your anniversary yesterday. Tell us how you came Thank to Vermont you. and how you and Sue got together. Tell us a little bit about that. So um, I came to Vermont really uh, probably stemming from a, a pretty failed first date uh, with Sue. This is Sue Minter, um, my wife. And it was of going to, we were going to school. We were both, um, Sue lived across the hall from me at a big co-op house that we both lived in at Harvard. And we, uh, on a weekend, we came with friends to Killington and I really had hardly known her. And we stood atop an icy mogul field at Killington and she skied it beautifully. So naturally as a, a young man, 
uh, endowed with uh, a lot of ego and little common sense, I assumed it must be easy because she made it look so easy. And I proceeded to somersault down uh, the slope and it land at the feet of um, this young woman who I um, was interested in with my gear strewn all over the slope. And she uttered the words that are like a dagger uh, to you know a young male skier, which was, oh, it's okay, I'll get your gear. Um, so she proceeded to collect all my gear around the slope. Um, but then it went much better from there. I learned never to compete with her again. And we've uh, had a happy life with two fabulous kids. Um, and what brought us to Vermont is love of the mountains. We were weekend warriors from Boston. And Sue got a job um, in 1991 with the then new office of the Conservation Law Foundation. It was a new Vermont office. And she came up supposedly on a year fellowship. That year has turned into 30. Um, we never looked back. Um, so we decided to make our home in the mountains instead of just having weekends in the mountains. And we both love to ski. And um, as you probably know, I've written a number of books about backcountry skiing in the Northeast. So it's really nice to have that backcountry right in my backyard. Well, you're a terrific couple and we're so we're so privileged to have you here in Vermont. Um, so share with us a little bit about your collaborations with your sister, Amy Goodman. Uh, who since 1996 has been the host of the, the radio show Democracy Now. She's your sister. And um, so tell us a little bit about her and the collaboration you have with her and the work that you've done with your great sister, Amy Goodman. So I like to think I'm my sister's biggest fan. I listen to Democracy Now and watch it at 8 a.m. Uh, most mornings. Um, and uh, Amy and I have written four books together. And it really began, our first one was in 2003. Uh, we did this, we collaborated against uh, our mother's wishes. She said, uh, don't do that because you, uh, you need a sister more than you need a co-author. And uh, it, it was, you know, it was a wonderful collaboration. Amy is brilliant. She is uh, and in, has an incredible mind for what matters, for what's important, for finding uh, voices, as she says, for going to where the silence is. You know, who are the voices not at the table? Who are the real forces be, that are making the news? It's not men in suits in Washington. It's people in communities all over the world who don't have the camera and the mics uh, turned towards them. So, um, you know, the story, the work with Amy has been wonderful. And um, I think the work that Democracy Now! does has been essential in the world for bringing the voices of the grassroots to a larger audience. And working with my sister, um, you know, at times we wanted to pull each other's hair out. And um, we evolved over the course of four books to a way to work together. Co-authorships uh, are, are, are not easy. There's a lot of negotiating, you know, how you do it. And it's we had the good fortune to do enough books together that we managed to figure out uh, a nice way to do it, a good way to work together. But I consider myself very lucky um, to have done those collaborations with her. Well, I think it's fascinating. Um, I assume that Amy is your older sister. Yeah. I think it's fascinating that both of you ended up as writers and hosts of your own radio shows. I mean, you both sort of followed each other's careers in a very simple um, in a very, in a very um, fabulous way. And I think it's fascinating that both of you ended up there. I think it really is an outgrowth of our kitchen table uh, in our family. We would debate the issues of the day around that kitchen table. We had relatives, you know, we had a very conservative uncle who was a sock salesman in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. We had more, they were all immigrants. They had all fled Rus Russian immigrants, Ukrainian immigrants, actually, to be more specific. They had fled persecution in Russia and pogroms and such. So, um, you know, there was not necessarily a lot of agreement around the table. Uh, we had it coming from every side. And as we went out in the world, we kind of recreated that table wherever we went. 
gathering voices, arguing, pushing each other, um, questioning the news of the day and how we got there. So I think that's kind of where it all began. Well, I hope your mother was pleased that it all worked out the way it did. Um, so let's talk about your career, which has landed you on national TV shows, including PBS, NewsHour, NPR's Fresh Air, C-SPAN, C-SPAN, and CNN, to name a few. So David, what would be your most urgent message to our nation today? I think to be engaged. I think that, um, you know, the, the, the tagline of the Washington Post these days has been changed to democracy dies in darkness. I think I have that right. But um, <clears throat> we are at a very perilous moment in our history. And, you know, one of the things, uh, really formative experiences for me was um, I reported from South Africa at the height of apartheid. I spent many years going back and forth. And then Sue and I lived there for a year when Nelson Mandela was president. And I wrote a book about South Africa's transformation from apartheid. So I've seen authoritarianism from the inside at its height, at its, uh, the violence, the repression, and the ways that it is um, justified by good people, you know, intelligent people who will explain to you why you know, government repression, violent crackdowns are actually a good thing, that they preserve law, that they enable rights. So I've seen, you know, the banality of evil is the phrase that comes to mind. Good, smart people telling me why apartheid in South Africa was a good thing. So that experience has really led me to know how fragile democracy is and to know how it can so easily be normalized the times we're going through right now are not normal. Half of our population, all women, have just lost the right to determine um, how their bodies, you know, what goes on in their bodies. Every pregnancy in half the states of this country is a potential crime scene now. So these are dire moments. You know, when we talk about, I've interviewed on the Vermont Conversation People who follow it may know I have a particular uh, fascination with authoritarianism. And I've interviewed a lot of the leading scholars of fascism and authoritarianism. Tim Snyder from Yale, Jason Stanley, Steve Levitsky. These are all people who've written at some length about it. And, um, you know, if you're at home not concerned, I can tell you that these scholars are deeply concerned. They feel that the red flags, you know, the, the authoritarian playbook that they speak about, uh, they're hearing it being read from night after night, day after day. So be engaged. And at this moment now be fiercely engaged. So how, so how does our country deal with the fact that we have the Supreme Court that we have now, and then we have a major media outlet that basically is pushing the big lie and, and uh, helping us to move closer and closer to fascism. I mean, how do, we, how do we move out of that with the situation that we're in right now? I know being engaged is important. And I think there were 20 million people who have been watching these hearings, but I think there are a lot of us citizens who are feeling helpless uh, with the voter suppression that's going on, the gerrymandering, uh, is the, are the elections ever going to be fair again if all of these uh, changes are being put in, put in place? So, so what do you tell the common citizen who is engaged, what, you know, where we are and what's the best thing that we can do to help protect our democracy? Because I agree with you, things are very, very dire. I think that the answer to that is that there's not a single answer. There is um, everything has to be done grassroots action, electoral action, um, you know, every kind of engagement and activism that there is needs to be mobilized now. It is certainly, the answer is certainly not just elect, uh, you know, democratically minded people. Um, we know that's not enough. You know, the re, we're in a new reality in, as of a few weeks ago where the Supreme Court has now been, where it's come to pass, you know, Justice Stephen Breyer, who just retired, warned a year ago about the danger that the court becomes politicians in robes. 
And I think we're at that moment. You just and, did a, you just did a, a conversation on your show. Would you talk us a few a little bit and direct people to that? Yes. So the most recent one I did is with the new president of the Vermont Law and Graduate School, Rod Smola, who is a has had a storied career as a civil liberties lawyer. And I asked him that question: um, Have the Supreme Court? He's argued before the Supreme Court. Uh, he's a well-known First Amendment lawyer. And I asked him, does he believe that the, the court, the justices are now politicians in robes? And he said, I believe that we are perilously close to that. This is not a guy who's prone to hyperbole, by the way. Um, but, you know, the, the Supreme Court, courts in general, are, if the house is on fire, they're the escape route. You know, that, there's what we've all grown up thinking as where reason would prevail where our democratic ideals would be preserved. Right now, the house is on fire and the escape route has been closed off. That's what the Supreme Court has just let us know in the last couple of weeks with the decisions it's, it's given, handed down on abortion, on gun control, on separation of church and state, on climate change, all of those avenues, the courts have now, they've sent up a bright flare saying, it, we, there's no help here. So what's your hope for the future? I mean, My so hope for the future has a message to us about what what I know being engaged is important, but what's your hope for the future? What do you hope happens in the future to help us get through this time? I think that democracy, you know, I saw in South Africa an entire nation. I mean, this was a minority rule country and the black majority had every reason to feel completely dispirited you know, arms, elections, courts, everything was stacked against them. And, you know, at the end of the day, governments rely on the support and cooperation of their people to function. And those people can render governments unable to function. That's what happened in South Africa. White South Africans did not hand over power out of generosity. They were forced to hand over power. Well, look at what's happening in Ukraine. You must have, uh, being that your family um, uh, originated from Ukraine to this country, you must have some deep thoughts about that. They're fighting yeah. desperately for their freedom and- and. I mean, that's a worst case scenario, you know, where it, it breaks into open horrific warfare with, you know, the, the casualty toll there is, it's beyond words. So, do you see that happening in our country? Do you see a return to the 60s? Well, the 60s were a reaction by people against, uh, you know, a war that they, you know, the Vietnam War, which was illegal, unjustified, wrongheaded, and um, murderous. And we see what happened. You know, people took to the streets. And, you know, in South Africa, they talked about... Um, making the country ungovernable under apartheid. Um, that happens in a variety of ways. It's sort of what happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's well, we a long, slow, yeah, difficult route. And no, I, I hope, uh, so you we hope have that that can work. Yes. Well, it was, we were also fighting for, you know, women's rights, civil rights, human rights. I mean, the 60s revolution was, was just 17% of the populace out there fighting for all these rights. And, um, so who knows? But listen, I'm going to move on to something a little lighter. I want okay. you to talk about your books and the articles <laughs> and the book that you just released this year, and you won an award for the best backcountry skiing in the Northeast, and the award was given by the International Ski History Association. Tell us a little bit about your newest book. So Best Backcountry Skiing in the Northeast is actually the 30th anniversary edition of a book I began in my late 20s that I first wrote. And um, it's part guidebook, part history. And this, this skiing history that I write about, um, I came into these books very much by accident. I was a, you know, budding freelance writer in, the, in, in my 20s. I had just written a story called The Northeastern Renaissance about the revival of backcountry skiing in the Northeast when I got a call from the Appalachian Mountain Club asking me if I'd like to write uh, a book about skiing and they're a hiking organization and they didn't know much about skiing so it could be whatever I wanted. 
And I was a history major in college and I love the history. So I began traveling around the Northeast, finding the trailblazers who cut the original trails and trying to go find many of them um, because many of them were no longer had, uh, you know, while they were the only trails of the day, they later had chairlifts put on them. So I went and found the ones that didn't have chairlifts put on them. And they all had a rich history, a rich culture. And the story of skiing in the, is really the story of how the Northeast was settled. You know, Vermont was a very poor rural agrarian state in the 1930s. And a state forester named Perry Merrill thought, well, maybe if I send people the Civilian Conservation Corps to cut ski trails, it could help this poor little state. So I began going around finding those trails and slowly over these 30 years, a whole subculture rose up. And now today backcountry skiing is um, incredibly popular. And no, I did not time these books to come out during a global pandemic, but that didn't hurt the interest in them. Um, uh, so I, you know, I always try to find at least one silver lining for bad things that happen. So there's my silver lining of backcountry skiing took off. So um, it's a passion project, but I've always thought, and, and it was quite by accident, but I love doing it. And I love that there's a culture of people searching and enjoying and loving being in the white wilderness. And if I've had any part in, uh, in getting them there, I'm very happy. I think you have. I think you did have a part. So for my viewers, it's called David Goodman's book is Best Backcountry Skiing in the Northeast. And I'm sure you can get it at your local bookstore. Support your local bookstores. So tell us what you're working on now. And tell us about your weekly podcast for WDEV. Yeah, so it's a podcast that's both on radio with WDEV Wednesdays at 1, the Vermont Conversation, and uh, published by Vermont Digger, um, which is where many people see it who are beyond the listening range of WDEV. Uh, so it's both an article and podcast twice a week, well, depending if I have two guests or one. And uh, that has, um, I have really loved doing these conversations. I have a very free hand. And, you know, what's wonderful with Vermont Digger, it's a Vermont-based publication, but uh, I can cover national and international topics and local topics. And that's what you find there. So, you know, uh, recently I had on the doctor whose case legalized abortion in Vermont, Dr. Jack Beecham, now 80 years old. Um, it's why abortion was legalized in Vermont a year before Roe v. Wade. Um, that's one of my favorites. I've had famous people, Jamie Raskin, the congressman was on uh, last month. Um, uh, Jane Mayer, the investigative journalist for The New Yorker had her on. Uh, so I have on journalists, activists, Bill McKibben was my guest last week talking about his latest book and activism. Um, so these are, you know, I, I kind of, the things that interest me in the world and the news, I get to find interesting people to talk about it on the Vermont Conversation and share it with Vermont and beyond. So uh, that I would say is, is the thing that takes much of my time and interest. Um, I'm also working on books and articles as we speak. Um, but I'm, I'll I'll keep it to the to the Vermont conversation here because it's the easiest one to direct people to, and you can find it on Vermont Ticker. So, so you and Sue have two grown and accomplished children, and I'm sure you think a lot about their future. So, can you share with us your vision for the future of our world, based on the realities that we are witnessing on the ground, and what advice do you have for humanity, David? I am one of those people who is an eternal optimist. Even as dire and dark as the situation we are in now, I have seen um, light come from darkness. I have seen good things come out of bad. I do believe that every challenge has inside it an opportunity. I saw democracy come from authoritarianism in South Africa. You know, my family's own story fleeing persecution uh, in, you know, Russia and Eastern Europe uh, and coming to have a life here. So I do believe that the road is long, um, but I do believe that the arc bend towards justice, but it doesn't happen on its own. So um, I have faith. I believe that um, we've left our kids a mess. And unfortunately, a lot of their lives, they're going to spend cleaning it up. 
um, but they are up to the task. It is, and um, you know, our kids are the hope. Um, and hopefully we have passed on to them enough of the seeds of goodness and fairness and democracy that they will continue to raise that candle and uh, be sure that it keeps burning brightly, even in dark times. Well, David Goodman, you are a gem. To my viewers, you can learn more about David at dgoodman.net. dgoodman.net. I encourage you to visit David's website and learn more about him and about his incredible work. And to you, my friend, it's been a delight knowing you all these years. I so honor you and I love you. And I thank you for all that you've done. Um, I'm going to ask you to stay on after the show so I can do that privately. But to my viewers, thank you for joining us today for this great Vermont conversation. With <laughs> Goodman. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you for joining us today. And I will see you soon.